All right, welcome to the webinar, Setting Up Your Farm to Hire Employees. My name is Kelly Henwood and I'm the WSU Extension Regional Small Farms Coordinator. And this is part one of many series that WSU Extension as well as the North Olympic Development Council will be hosting throughout the year. This series is focused on all things farm human resources and employee management. Thanks to grant funding from the USDA Rural Business Development Program, this webinar is free and we will be recording it for future viewing afterwards. The target audience for these webinars are farmers for farmers who have not yet or are just beginning to hire farm employees on their farm. Uh, the next two webinars are occurring next Thursday, April 1st, and the topic for that webinar is employment insurance. And we'll hear from a number of insurance agents about how to cover your employees on your farm. And we'll be talking about more risk activities and, and how to cover employees using equipment and other labor activities to consider. The following webinar will occur Thursday, April 8th. And the topic will be costs of farm labor. And that's where we'll be hearing from labor and industries as well as a very knowledgeable local accountant and we'll really talk more about some tax requirements for hiring labor and setting up how to set up payroll services and really get into more of the costs of uh, what it costs to have farm employees. So just a few Zoom housekeeping before we jump into our webinar. So like I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our Small Farms YouTube, YouTube channel as well as our website afterwards as well as the next two webinars will also be recording. Um, we have created a, a list of links and resources that will accompany this educational series and that will be emailed to all of the registrants after the series is completed as well as posted on our website. We'd love to hear your feedback. So we'll also be sending you all an eval. Since this webinar is grant funded, we'd love to uh, see how these webinars have impacted your farm and we'd love to hear from you all. So please keep an eye out for the eval and give us your feedback. And then lastly, if you have a question, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Or if you're on a smartphone, you can uh, scroll and find the Q&A function. Okay, so moving on, I just wanted to introduce who's here today, or at least shout out hello to everyone who's here for our, our uh, guests. We, our hosts are myself, Kelly Henwood, as well as Mark Bowman with the North Olympic Development Council. He'll have a chance to introduce himself. And then today we'll be speaking with Karen Williams who owns and operates Red Dog Farm out of Chimicum, Washington. And I just wanted to throw this up here that here are the topics we're, we'll be covering today, uh, just so you all know what you'll be um, what you're in for today. Payroll services, some of the challenges in finding consistent farm labor, how to find farm employees, where do you look for and post to seek uh, employees for your farm. Uh, using labor efficiently and then of course we'll hear from Karen at Red Dog about some of her successes and challenges she's had. So with that I'm going to turn it over to Mark Bowman. Mark? Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, my name is Mark Bowman. I'm the Sustainable Agricultural Coordinator for Clallam and Jefferson County um, as a part of North Olympic Development Council. And my position was funded by an, our uh, Rural Business Development Grant through the USDA. So um, working with farmers uh, to helping them overcome um, hurdles to growth is the goal that I have this year to work with at least 12 uh, farmers one-on-one -on -one, uh, through those hurdles and, and uh, uh, try to get them um, either more diversified or growing more acres or uh, whatever the topic may be. So working with, with the farmers here in the two counties to, to help them. And then the second part is these classes uh, as part of the um, Rural Business Development Grant. Um, 
provide a, a series of classes throughout the whole year that are a little more in depth than just the general um, uh, classes, and but really dig into some topics uh, like labor and having the opportunity to learn more um, from uh, farmers like Karen and also professionals in the industry uh, to how they've overcome some of these issues. So with that, um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Karen Williams of Red Dog Farm and give her a chance to introduce herself and uh, start out by also introducing and giving us a little bit of a history on the evolution of Red Dog Farm. So with that, Karen, welcome. And I'll uh, let you take that first question and an introduction. Great. Um, well, I'm Karen Williams. Um, I own and operate Red Dog Farm in Chimicum. Uh, we're a diversified organic vegetable operation. Uh, we market um, our produce really widely. Um, we have a 250 member CSA. Uh, we sell to a lot of local stores. Um, we sell to restaurants both locally and more regionally um, through um, uh, shared distribution with another company that goes a little bit farther um, delivery route than we do. Um, we also have a farm stand on our on our farm and we participate in two weekly farmers markets. Um, we currently are growing produce on 23 acres. Um, we grow a really wide range of vegetables, everything from, um, well, let's just say uh, most things that grow here, probably about 150 different varieties of produce. Um, I started a Red Dog Farm in 2008, and my first year of operation, I just grew produce on five acres. Um, and that first year, I, as far as labor goes, I had three interns. Um, and, and by interns, I mean that they weren't paid an hourly wage. They were instead paid a monthly stipend, and there was a lot of education as a part of the exchange for labor. Um, but they were here full time. And then I had two part-time employees as well that first year. Um, my second year in 2009, I quickly um, realized that interns weren't a good match for what I was trying to do, um, particularly with housing obstacles. And so I switched to having all uh, paid employees, hourly employees. And that was um, really key for, for the farm to make that switch. Um, and then to give you sort of context, like last year in 2020, um, I had 19 full-time employees and four part-time employees during the peak season. Um, our employment is um, very is very varied throughout the season. Um, in the in the winter, we're usually down to about five, um, partly full time, maybe like 30, 35 hour a, a week employees, and then it kind of just scales up as we get into the peak season, which is generally like July through um, October for us. Um, so. Yeah, and then as far as um, some of the different positions on the farm, um, we um, so currently we have field crew is what um, the we have a lot of field crew positions and that's an entry level position um, where we're looking for employees that are, you know, either brand new to farming or have, you know, definitely have some interest enough to apply to work on a farm, but um, we're not expecting a lot of experience from them. And they have a really varied um, task list that they do depending on what seasons they're working in, but they're definitely doing all our field work. Um, so a lot of harvesting, um, transplanting, moving irrigation, as well as uh, stocking our farm stand, doing deliveries, um, helping out, um, at market, um, helping out in the greenhouse, things like that. And then we have some more specialized positions. Um, so we have farm, farm managers or leads kind of depending on the year and who's, um, what level of experience and interest people have in scope of management. Um, for example, this year we have three farm managers um, and we don't have any leads this year. Last year we had one farm manager and three leads. So it, that sort of fluxes every year. Um, and then we have specialists. We have this year, we have a tractor specialist and we have a maintenance specialist. Um, and they are very, they're specialized in their areas that they, they do, but they're not managing people. They're just working on their, um, in their areas. Um, and then let's see, we have a farmer's market um, main staff person that um, runs our farmer's markets and is just the point person for that. And then we have an office manager who just keeps everything running smoothly and keeps me off the computer a lot, so. Um, so anyway, that's a, like a very broad overview um, of Red Dog Farm and where we're at now, where we've kind of come from. Great. That was a great introduction, Karen. Um, 
keeping you off the computer. You're so good at uh, at Excel spreadsheets. I bet that's hard to keep you off the computer. <laughs> Well, I thank you. That's so nice of you to say that. I do. I mean, I still am on the computer a lot, but I, yeah, I, I don't have to be on it all the time. So, okay. so uh, as a few follow up questions to something you just said, you, you mentioned you have a couple of specialists. Um, are those, uh, talk a little bit about uh, 19 full time employees during the summer or during the peak season and four part time and then five that you keep over. How many year to year of the seasonal employees come back? And, and how do you incentivize trying to keep employees coming back when they're off for a period of time and coming back versus, you know, um, uh, just kind of starting all over again every year? What, what are some of the ish things you do? Yeah, that's, that's a great question and very near and dear to my heart because I, it's really important to retain employees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something I learned very early on, especially when you, when you get people who are really invested and who really enjoy the work and are a good fit for the farm. Um, we, you know, one of the things we do is we do staggered winter breaks. Um, I would say most of the people that work on the farm um, want to have at least a month, if not two months off in the winter. And some people even want three or four months. And so we um, ask people how much time they want to have off for people who are continuing on, how much time they want to have off, what months. And, you know, some people are very flexible and some people know exactly what, you know, they want November and December off. And so we stagger those time periods. So we're able to keep um, probably, I think about eight people going over the winter with you know each having one to two month breaks um, but just kind of staggering those okay. um and let's see what else um yeah it really helps that people do want to have some time off um if, if everyone wanted to work 12 months out of the year continuously um that would be i think that would feel like more of a hardship for both the farm and for the employees um but so that sort of works in our favor um, other than that, you know, some of the specialists like the office manager and the maintenance manager, they do have year round positions and they both prefer to work 12 months and, um, and then have their vacations whenever they want. And that works really well because those positions keep going in, in fact, sometimes even busier in the, in the off season. Um, yeah. And as far as incentivizing people to come back, I mean, I think the best, the best thing to do is just, um, you know, it's just all the good practices for being an employer, um, having, clear expectations, good communication, trust, respect, um, just developing uh, a healthy functional workplace that people want to be in. And, um, and, and, you know, people love to take pride in their work and, um, you know, just, just kind of fostering all that and building, um, building a place that people want to work at, I guess is what it really comes down to. And then, and then there's a culture that they all create as well. Um, um, that's something I've really learned a lot about over um, the last, um, I don't know how many years it's been now, 14 years that I've been running the farm is that so much happens between employees that I'm, I'm not a part of and, um, and just the, the culture that gets built up on the farm and um, whether that's sort of, you know, like a, um, the fun culture and the hangout and the, you know, the community, but then there's also so many other aspects to it of, you know, what's the communication style here? What happens if you make a mistake? Um, you know, you know, just all kinds of things like that. Like, do people, is it a good fit for people? And, um, and it's just been amazing to me how much of that I've just had to, you know, steer in one direction or another, but then get out of the way and, and just notice when things are, I'm like, yeah, this is going great. Okay, I'm just going to keep staying out of the way or like, oh, I need to get involved and um, and set a course, you know, on how I want to change this aspect of the culture. And, and sometimes that's just waiting, waiting for a change of guard. And sometimes it's, you know, more actively getting proactively getting involved. Um, I feel like I've gotten really off topic. I'm sorry. What, no, that's <laughs> actually, you know, this is this is perfect because you're kind of answering about four questions I have for I you throughout this. Them. No, that's perfect because I'm going to follow back up with some of these uh, to some of these points Great. you've made. So you're you're doing just fine. So okay. <laughs> yeah, and and we're and we're keeping this relaxed and and fun and having a good dialogue. So you're doing just fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so one of the a question I do have for you is, um, when do you know? Or what is the feeling you get when you need to hire an additional employee, like going from 19 to 20? Or what are what are some of the pressure points you feel? That's like, it's a pressure point I can get over, 
at this moment, or it's a pressure point that tells me I need one more person to do X or Y? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think um, for for sort of for our field crew and our um, you know just general new hires, no experience um, necessary. Um, it just really comes down to are we you know are we getting everything done in the set amount of time without employees working over hours and um, you know are we just are we getting it done how stressed are people is you know is quality still up are people frantic and um, you know and that's when we know we need to you know bring on more um, sort of either temporary or you know peak season employees um, in terms of creating the more um, specialized roles um, that's something that happens more gradually like I think back to when I first realized we could really use someone specializing in maintenance. Um, and that was when things just kept breaking and we, I kept buying more and more equipment and more, um, more things that I didn't personally know how to fix. And so it was a matter of like, am I going to pay shop time? Am I going to keep trying to trade veggies with my friends who know how to fix things? Or, you know, at a certain point it just became obvious that we needed someone that was going to keep things operational so we could not have breakdowns that were just crazy expensive to be um, out, you know, down a tractor when we really needed it or another piece of equipment. So um, just kind of realizing that that's kind of like when I realized, oh, I'm at this next step where I actually need to um, just have more, yeah, just step it up basically and have a more um, solid plan about how I'm going to practically address breakdowns in this case and yeah. not just react. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a number of issues there with somebody specialized, like a maintenance person. Uh, you've got uh, downtime is probably the worst thing that you can have on a piece of equipment in the summertime when everything is so time sensitive. Um, and also, you like to talk to the cost of outside shop time and the delays um, and having a person then that knows your equipment and knows mm -hmm. your schedule and also a person that can um, that's what the winter's for, right? Get all that equipment in, in the barn and get it repaired and maintenance and ready for the next season. So I, did you find that, that there's, uh, in addition to the stress release, relief of having that person, that it really provided you some, um, not just efficiency, but value, monetary value? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, we've had a number of maintenance specialists that have worked here, but they, yeah. Um, the level of skill that each of them have brought to the farm has just been phenomenal um, in terms of some of them have been, you know, great welders or just great, um, you know, great minds that know how to problem solve and, um, and improve the equipment that we had or advise, maybe say like, you know, I don't think you're getting what you need from this piece of equipment. Have you thought about this other one or buying something else? And um, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it's just been, it's really helped the farm move to like the next level to have someone that has, um, has a skill that I just completely lack. <laughs> That's actually a good point. What we talked about that is, you know, uh, bringing in skills that, that cover, you know, uh, current weaknesses in the operation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure you probably have somebody now also that you just build pieces of equipment that are specially specialized for your operation too, right? Uh, yeah, to some extent, but I, you know, I have kind of found that, um, you know, the people that design equipment really know what they're doing. <laughs> and it's often just cheaper to buy something than design it from scratch. But there are, but there are some things that, yeah, they, the maintenance specialist has designed and, and put into place. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a mix. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the next question I have for you is, um, how do you find applicants? How do you, how do you, what methods of advertising do you use? And I'll have, and Kelly will probably step in here with some sources too, or, or have some sources to post. Um, so how do you find them? Um, what percentage of them do you find locally? And what mm -hmm. methods do you use for advertising? Yeah. Um, well, we, we start by creating a job description and a job posting and, um, and I usually have, so I'm usually part of that. And then one of my farm managers takes the lead on hiring and she, and she, this year it's a she, she's involved in that. And then also Rachel is our office manager is involved in, um, in facilitating the whole hiring process. So um, yeah, we figure out what it is we need um, in terms of skills, you know, abilities, qualifications, that sort of thing, um, and put it out in the world. Um, so we, we have a number of, pull up my list here. We have a number of places that we, um, Sort of advertise our positions. Um, we, you know, definitely on our website. Um, we 
um, of social media like Facebook, Instagram, those are becoming a huge way of finding um, new employees. And I think that's largely from all our current employees and previous employees become you know, followers on the different social media and then their friends follow. And there's just, it's really a word of mouth um, that com that's stemming, I think, from our employees um, is how we're able to reach um, more and more people through those venues. Um, and then there are some actual uh, websites that we post on. There's Beginning Farmers, um, Rogue Farm Corps, there's Atra, um, Eco Farm, Good Food Jobs. There's a number of different um, websites like that that, um, that, we, that we spend time to do our posts on. And then there's listservs that, like the one that Kelly runs from WSU. Um, and there's a number of those that we send out an email to to make sure that they're sending it out to all their groups as well. Um, so yeah, and then we just wait for people to apply. Um, occasionally we will put it on, we have a little A-frame that we put out at the end of our driveway and we have actually gotten some really good employees from just driving by and seeing that. Um, <laughs> it seems like a lot of people also um, are interested in moving to this area and so are intentionally searching farm jobs, Port Townsend, Shimicum, or going to the farmer's market or the co-op and then seeing the list of farms and then contacting farms from there. So it's huge. I can't understate state enough how huge it is that we live in a very popular, or my farm's in a very popular area that young people just flock to. And so people are, it seems like a lot of people want to move here and are looking for a farm job and they come across us and apply and that's, we're lucky in that way. It, it is, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Karen, one one thing that is so incredible about your farm and other local farms who do provide employment opportunities is you're providing local jobs and you're contributing to the local economy in a really huge, um, important and impactful way. And um, I'll add a couple other uh, lists of the, the other places you mentioned were all super great and well used by farms across the state and the country besides Atra and Good Food Jobs. But colleges, a lot of folks, you know, college grads are setting up their summers or setting up um, opportunities for further, um, not just education, but looking for, looking for summer jobs. So definitely check out colleges. I love how you said that you put out a bulletin board on your, at your farm. I think that's wonderful. Um, yeah, locally, bulletin boards, literal bulletin boards as well at businesses, feed stores, granges. Um, since a lot of things have been digital and virtual the last year, um, definitely casting a wide net is important to think about for farms. Your local newspaper, don't discredit your local sources first, um, but also I've heard of farmers, you know, putting their job descriptions at their farm stands and farmers markets, like you mentioned, their booth and getting really great applicants. And then of course your website or social media channels. Um, and then I, I can't emphasize enough the, the support organizations, like you mentioned, Karen, our agriculture listserv, farm, farmers getting on as many ag and food listservs as you can and um, sending job posts to folks like conservation districts, land trusts, food co-ops, granges, and other food and farm organizations like the Tilth Alliance here in Washington State, and of course, w WC Extension. So um, as many places as you can post, the better uh, chance and the bigger pool of applicants you may get. And it might help ease that challenge of finding skilled labor, the wider net you cast. Kelly, we just did have a comment on um, colleges, uh, posting on college, at college campuses. Is there a certain way that you know of, of posting on at college campuses? Yeah, I think it's really uh, researching the programs, if there's any food or ag programs at colleges and campuses, reaching out to those faculty or staff or extension um, agents like myself can help you know, provide contacts for that as well as private colleges or you know, public universities, really just finding the programs that um, you know, the humanities and arts and sciences uh, would be the best fit. But honestly, I've seen folks who are not in any of those fields um, coming out of college who are just interested in that kind of experience or they're looking for a job that is really outside of their, um, their education and they're looking for more, more skills. So. Yeah, we have had some success. Um, 
just even talk, talking to different colleges. Um, I, don't, I can't remember if it's guidance counselors or career development type places, and they do have a lot of postings or sometimes they, have, they used to have binders and now I'm sure it's all online, but just you know opportunities for summer um, employment or summer internships. And um, that's a great way to reach a lot of people as well. I also wanted to add on, I forgot to answer your question about local, um, but we, we absolutely love to hire local people. Um, I say we have a pretty small percentage of local hires, maybe about 15%. Um, and it's not intentional. It just it ends up, I don't know why it is, but um, we just get a lot of applicants that want to move here and very few applicants that are actually already living here. But we do get some and, and it's nice when people are applying who already live here because they already have housing it's not this huge transition for them to move and, um, you know, this huge life change. So it's, and they often can start a lot more um, time in a timely manner. So. Yeah. And that's a great point. Actually um, there are some farms who do hire local high school grads or high school seniors. We will be getting more into that in the third part of this webinar series with the labor and industry staff about the legalities of hiring farm laborers and farm employees, but that is an option. And I've seen some really successful farms who are hiring either their family members or friends that are either underage or right at 18 who are looking for that, you know, first job experience. Um, that may be something to consider for farms who are maybe needing some entry level farm employees. Um, I think it's a great way to support local, you know, local jobs for local kids or local young people. Mm -hmm. well, so Karen, I want to move on to the next question for you. What do you look for in a new employee? Now that you've been doing this for 14 years and you've, you've gone through a number of employees over the time, um, what, is, what do you find that is trainable and what is not trainable in a new hire? So what, what kind of skill set are you looking for that is absolutely necessary for you? And then what, what is trainable? Um, yeah, I mean, of course, it really depends on the position. Um, but bottom line, I'd say um, attitude is like really high up there. Um, farm work is just it's really hard. <laughs> and there's days when it's really fun. And then there's a lot of days where it's really hard and exhausting. And so um, ha having people that, um, that have an idea of what they're getting themselves into, and also like really are passionate about the work and um, and just kind of have this can-do attitude and, and hopefully have been in some situations before where things were, they faced some physical challenges and have strategies how to move through them or even just experience of it does come to an end and then, you, and then something fun happens or you know you get warm again or whatever it is. Um, so I feel like that, that attitude is huge. Um, experience, you know, it just takes time, but um, I'd say experience is not trainable, of course, it just, you know, people build on it, but people, people, I feel like people can learn pretty much any task, people can get faster at any task. Um, some people are naturally going to get faster at a, at a quicker trajectory than others, but um, that is definitely something that is trainable. And I've seen some people that started out really slow become some of the fastest workers, some of the most skilled workers. Um, I definitely also look for um, previous physical labor. I think there's, I think that's really important also for the, you know, the heart, the physical hardship experience is really important, but also there's just something that happens when people have learned to use their bodies, their hands in connection with, um, a men, you know, following directions, but using their hands and learning how to move quickly or move in a sort of uncomfortable and unusual way. Um, it's just sort of like a, a neural pathway that happens when you have experience um, doing physical labor, whether it's detailed or more like gross motor skills. And at, it, it just takes time to build those pathways. And so if people have experience, like, you know, even washing dishes in a restaurant, like that's huge. Um, having the experience of having, learning how to move quickly um, in, you know, in a set area um, is, is, is valuable. Um, let's see what else. Um, oh, the real, realistic expectations. Um, so we're a production farm. We use tractors. We're very efficient. Um, you know, we um, the crew is, is working on really um, uh, very particular task oriented things. And so um, we're, you know, we really specify to especially new incoming crew members that, you know, we are we're not a permaculture farm. We're not a, um, a nonprofit. We're just we're a for-profit production, we're gonna work really hard, work as a team and 
sometimes, you know, there's hard decisions that have to be made and we're not going to harvest every single crop, for example, or, um, you know, it's just, it's just a different kind of mindset. So just making sure people really are interested in, in that. And if people are looking for more of an educational experience or more of a, a no-till experience or something like that, we're just really clear, like that's, you're not going to be happy here or just really consider this. So just making sure people are really up for what we actually can provide. And, um, yeah, I think those are some of the main, the main things. Um, yeah. So uh, along that line, one other thing you mentioned earlier as uh, building a culture on, on your farm and, and, you're, and you've seen it uh, maybe partly you've instilled a culture, but also the team has built a culture. And when you bring on new employees, are you looking also to see if they're a good fit with the rest of the team and, and, part, and can kind of uh, fit into the culture that's been developed? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a great, that's a really great point. And that's why um, I always have, I don't just do the hiring anymore. I always have at least one of the managers involved in hiring because I, it, it's really important that they're more in touch with what the current culture is and, um, and making sure that we have, we're hiring people that are going to be a good fit. And, you know, of course, making sure we're not discriminating or, you know, giving people, giving people chances, but yeah, it's, it is really important that, um, you know, for example, like communication is a trait that we really value here on the farm. And so we, we ask a lot of questions during our interviews, like, how much do you enjoy communication? Do you like giving feedback? Do you like getting feedback? And of course we ask their references and, you know, some people really thrive in those communication rich cultures and other people feel really, um, kind of weighed down <laughs> by it. And so we're looking for people that, um, are really excited. Oh yeah. I love communication. I love, um, you know, sharing what I'm seeing and I, I like getting feedback and working towards, um, being, you know, improving and, and that kind of attitude is really helpful. Can I add to that, Mark? Sure. Go right ahead. Yeah. So, um, Karen, I love how you're all about being super specific in your expectations and requirements up front, And, um, I, I've heard from other farms, some of their support and how they support employees' success on the farm. I just wanted to add a couple more points is, like you said, providing written expectations from the get-go of what the farm's about and uh, what kind of physical activities that person, employee will be doing. And, and noting that you'll be providing on-farm and physical safety training so that each activity they're doing, they'll be supported and shown how to do that properly so they prevent injury or um, just increase efficiencies. But some other things that you mentioned that I wanted to point out too was, um, I loved how you talked about, or you, you alluded to a little bit about uh, workplace um, culture and getting to what's, you know, tolerance, like what's um, expected of employees in terms of um, how they treat others and getting back to some of your, um, uh, how you find folks to work on your farm. Um, I think it's really important for farmers to really consider equity and inclusion um, in, in how they're searching for farm employees and where they're posting, considering the audience of who will be uh, finding those jobs and also just providing that uh, safe and uh, safe and um, just a good culture of practices on your farm that welcomes everybody. So I just didn't know if you wanted to speak to that, Karen, but you just made me think of that point. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think it's really, it, yeah, obviously it's very important. Um, we, I've actually have worked with an HR person to kind of um, make sure that our process is very inclusive and our, you know, our language and our expectations in our, in our handbooks and so forth are, um, you know, up to legal standards as well as, um, just considering um, different, yeah, just different viewpoints and different experiences that people bring. Um, it is it is challenging um, finding uh, diverse employees. I'll say it's you know we tend to just really have. If you look at the the different employees that we've had, you know, currently and over the years, there's definitely a very common demographic theme, and it's it's really challenging to figure out how to broaden that um, and. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, def it's definitely a challenge and something that is, would be really helpful to get more resources with actually, um, because it's, it's hard to know. I mean, this, this area we live in is um, very predominantly white, very educated, um, 
you know, so just, yeah, just trying to figure out how to make sure we are being inclusive, not only um, once people are here are hired on the farm, but when, figuring out how we can reach out to a broader audience to attract new hires as well would be really helpful. That's great. Uh, as a sort of a side question, you mentioned you have an employee handbook. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, what section of the employee handbook seems to get updated the most? <laughs> Um, hmm, that's a good question. It, it's funny, I was just um, updating it not too long ago. Um, at this point, I'd say we're, we do very little updates from year to year, but um, for a number of years, there were, you know, a lot of updates. At one point, the employee handbook got really long, and then we decided to really shorten it down. It was just way too long, and, um, and figure out how to um, keep the handbook short and put, do other training separate, outside of the handbook. Um, you know, definitely we, we're, every year we update the legal definitions of what, um, you know, just discrimination and harassment and all that and make sure that we're up on all those. Um, you know, just over the, over the years, just refine, you know, this year or in the last couple of years we added in like, you know, as well as rules around smoking, we have to include rules around vaping and just, you know, as cultural different um, changes come in, make sure we're addressing those. Um, you know, we have a lot of things around safety. Um, I don't know what we update the most. Um, I don't know. Those are, well, those are, those are, well, you know, I, I think you sort of answered it. It's sort of the changes, both mm -hmm. um, cultural changes um, and also legal changes that, that occur, uh, making sure you're, you're current on, on those. So that sounds like a, what gets changed the most. Um, <laughs> um, so, and along that line, so what is the cost, what are some of the costs of having employees beyond wages? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you, what do you see? Um, yeah, beyond ways, I mean, definitely just the whole hiring, um, you know, recruitment, hiring, interviews, you know, that whole process, communicating even before they start work is, um, it definitely is a lot of time and um, it takes a lot of intention and focus as well. So there's that. And then the whole onboarding process of, you know, having employees the first, the first day they read it, they read the employee handbook, they do a lot of paperwork. Um, sort of the first two weeks, there's, we kind of stagger out a lot of different training, um, safety trainings. Kelly, you mentioned that we do, um, you know, how to lift properly training and um, do a tour around the farm to make sure we're pointing out some of the more hazardous areas and where the safety gear is and things like that. Um, so just that whole process is, um, is, you know, we don't make any money on, on that process. We're just orienting our employees. And, um, and then in addition to that, there's a whole training period um, where we're, um, you know, teaching the new employee on various tasks. It could be from, you know, you know, how to handle each different crop, whether it's in the field harvesting or in the pack shed, or it could be more skilled level, more skilled work than that. Um, but yeah, all of that is just, you know, it, it costs a lot of money and the farm isn't, um, the farm isn't making any money for those tasks, basically. Um, oh, and then the other part of that is like reviews and check-ins and, um, you know, and then just being, you know, we treat every employee as an individual and some individuals, you know, life is great for them and other people, you know, have hardship that comes up. And so there's, you know, sometimes we have to make different accommodations or there's more conversations that happen and just sort of the HR part of, of employing people. And, um, and there's just, yeah, that, that takes time as well and energy, <laughs> lots of energy. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, and on the flip side, then, what are some of the unseen benefits of having employees? Oh yeah, there's, there's a lot of unseen benefits, um, probably more than I can even think of right now. But one is, um, you know, just there's a momentum that, that comes when you get a group of people together who are really excited to be here and working. And that's, um, and I find that personally very infectious and, um, and it makes, you know, having, setting a schedule that, you know, my employees are showing up in these hours. And so I, I can orient myself around that schedule and it's, it's very helpful. Um, I, you know, I think back of when I worked just by myself and I think it's, um, yeah, it's really helpful to have just sort of this group momentum, this group energy, and that we're all in it together. And I think that makes every single part, every single person um, more focused and um, efficient. Um, let's see, there's also, um, you know, like Kelly, or I think, I can't remember, maybe it was you, Mark, that was talking about just the maintenance person, just the skills that people bring in, whether they're actually hired for a more specialist or more management role. Um, you know, I've, every single job on the farm there's been employees that are 
much better at that role or that task than I am. And um, they, they're bringing their skills and sharing them with the farm and the farm is, is benefiting from those, whether it's people management or maintenance or um, Excel, you know, Rachel, our office manager is a whiz at Excel, <laughs> you know, or just, you know, all the different, um, all those different traits that come in and just really um, just move the farm to the next level, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I also just find it, it's very personally rewarding to just work with, with people that are excited about this work and watching people sort of develop their, um, their own career or their own um, work skills and their, you know, learn, developing themselves basically professionally is, um, is really rewarding and I've, I've found that I've real I personally have gotten a lot out of that um, just sort of that mentoring and even just witnessing that process and um, and watching people grow to the next level and go from being um, you know only of working on a crew to like watching other people manage to maybe becoming a lead then becoming a, a farm manager themselves and managing you know 12 people it's um, it's really cool to see that. So um, there's just a lot of, you know, oh, there's a lot of things like that that are hard to sort of quantify, but I think it really, it's rewarding personally, it's rewarding for the whole group and it, it actually really benefits the farm as well. Yeah. Can I add Mark, would you, sure. Aaron, would you, um, it seems like there's always gonna be more work than you, the farm <laughs> owner and operator can do. I mean, would you say that in some ways it's cheaper to hire someone else to do the work so that you can free up you to work on the business rather than working in your business would you say that that's accurate absolutely absolutely yeah there's no way i could have grown my business if i didn't want to hire employees i just you know there's only so many hours in the day and then of course you yeah you can hire people that have skill sets that either they naturally have or they can work on developing those particular skill sets and or they can yeah people the employees can just work on the task and i yeah like you said i can work on growing the business or thinking um from a bigger point of view uh, or broader point of view of you know what what needs to happen next and where are we going you know five years ten years or even next week kind of thing yeah i think personally um i want to add on to hiring uh, as you can see i'm not the the youngest farm owner uh here so uh and I've hired some younger employees and, and I've learned a lot. I, you know, just little things like I'm, you know, I'm traditionally stuck in the way that I do a certain task or something and to watch somebody else do it, uh, do that task. I'm like, Oh, now why didn't I think of doing it that way? Or, or gosh, I, you know, I could have saved this much time by, you know, watching them do it, do a, a task a certain way or a certain style or, or manage some something, and so there really is a lot to be learned um, as a, as an owner uh, by hiring employees and and giving them even some latitude to maybe uh, experiment a little bit and finding uh, ways that are that are better and that will that the, the whole operation will benefit from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like agree. that would contribute to maybe maybe employee retainment. I mean, if they're feeling empowered to be more involved in the farm and they're part of the team, they're part of developing new systems or processes on the farm. I mean, that, that goes a long way for a farm employee to feel like they're contributing to something really positive and they're involved in it more than just clock in, clock out job. Mm -hmm. So just a little bit of a transition. So Karen, um, when you maintain payroll for your employees, do you do it internally? Do you have an online service? Do you have a local bookkeeper that does HR? How do you, how do you manage that on your operation? Yeah, we, um, well, I've done a couple of those options over the years, but um, currently we, we have, we're doing all our bookkeeping in-house. Well, I should say most of our bookkeeping in-house. Um, we have our office manager who does our biweekly payroll. Um, she does our biweekly, um, we have a biweekly tax payment we have to do the 940. Um, and then um, I do have, a, I hire a CPA, a local CPA to do my quarterlies. Um, uh, and that's also, I, I just have discovered over the years that I want, I want a more trained professional to look at my books quarterly and just kind of check in and see how things are going. So we've kind of developed that. I think at this point, probably we could just, we definitely could do the quarterlies in-house, but um, I've stuck with that. 
Um, in the past, when I first started having employees, I did have, I hired an external bookkeeper, um, and just a local person that just um, did bookkeeping for a number of local businesses. And that worked really well when I had just a handful of employees. Um, but I, over, over time, I realized that I really needed to understand the process because I, ultimately I, had, I was responsible um, from a tax point of view. If something went wrong, it was, it was up to me to understand that process. And so I actually ended up having that bookkeeper train me how to do the books. And then from there, I hired, um, I started hiring office managers to do the books, our books internally and, and our payrolls to me internally. And, and I can't say enough. I, I think early on starting my business, I, I couldn't do everything. There was just so much. And so I had to hire more external services like the, the bookkeeping and payroll. But I am a huge fan of, as a business owner, understanding how every aspect of the business works. And I think it's really important to, that I, that it was really important that I learned how it worked, even though I don't act, actively do it. I still understand the process. In a pinch, I could do it. I'd have to follow our alert procedures that we have written out to remember all the steps. But um, yeah, so I, I really like that um, we're at a point where we, we do it all in house and it's, um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so now on having a better understanding of your true cost of labor, how has it better informed you of the true cost of your product? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, labor is by far our biggest expense. Um, so what our employees are doing at, you know, at all times is just extremely important and to make sure that it's, um, it's accounted for, that people are following the processes and the systems that have been set up and, um, and yeah, it just, uh, oh, I see my connection is unstable. Is this, how's it going? Can you you're, hear me? You're still going well. Yep. Yeah, you're still going. Okay. Okay, great. Um, Okay, great. Um, so yeah, just trying to, um, you know, as much as we can focus on those tasks that are direct, having employees work on tasks that are directly uh, making the farm money is really important. Um, so anything around, you know, growing, pr growing the crops, um, critical management of the crops, you know, irrigating, um, critical weedings, of course, harvesting, washing and packing, delivering, selling at farmer's market, all those activities, you know, directly um, relate back to it, money incoming for the farm. Of course, there's some activities like fixing a broken down tractor. We, we have to do that. We don't make money on that, but if we don't do mm -hmm. it, then we lose money. So, um, so you know, trying to minimize those those tasks by doing the maintenance that is um, a lot a lot less work um, than doing a repair. And if we keep up with the maintenance, hopefully we'll have less repairs. Or um, you know, from like a crew point of view, you know, like if, if we missed a flaming, we do a lot of tractor work. So if we missed a tractor flaming, um, then we will know that, um, oh, we're going to have to hand weed this crop twice instead of one time, which means we're not, it's not as profitable. So instead of putting the crew to hand weed or hoe that crop twice, we're just going to till in the crop and start over again. Um, just sort of making decisions like that, just knowing how expensive the labor is and anytime we're doing something that, um, that isn't contributing to us, you know, making money on that crop, essentially, um, we, have, we have to make some hard decisions, or I have to make some hard decisions. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that's really interesting that uh, labor decisions like that um, can make the difference between retaining or disking under a crop, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And do you oh, actually, I can add some. Oh, Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, the other thing I was going to add is that, um, you know, I do spend a lot of time, um, you know, just crunching numbers. Um, um, so, you know, like my crew will sometimes they'll tip me off like, oh, this, the spinach harvest is taking a long time. So they know the next thing I ask is, well, how long, like how many people how much time and how many pounds did you get? And so I can just crunch a number of like, how, is this still worth it? Are we still, should we still be harvesting this crop? Or, um, you know, if something's really weedy, um, you know, the managers and leads are always paying attention to that so they can, you know, tip me off. Like this is, you know, we started, ho there's, you know, five beds of carrots, we started hoeing, we're a quarter way through one, there's three of us, it took 20 minutes, like, what do you think? And I can just get on my calculator, how much wage am I paying? What's the payroll taxes? Um, how much are we gonna make on this crop? And just quickly determine 
like, yeah, thumbs up, like this is worth it, or no, like this is barely worth it, but we're kind of gonna be weak on our CSA for this, the week that this crop is gonna be ready, so we're gonna push through, or sometimes like, oh, this isn't worth it, there's other things we could be doing that are much more, gonna have a much higher return and um, profit, you know, affect the profit for the farm. So abandoned, let's move on. And so just making some of those decisions by just crunching some really quick and easy numbers. Okay. A, a question I wanna ask, and, and I'll, I'll kind of give you an example of how I do this. I have an employee that uh, is not regular, but uh, comes uh, like one or two days a week. So what I do is, um, I don't have them do regular tasks because regular tasks would be everyday things like feeding animals and, and these sort of things. But um, I have them work on very specific tasks that would take me a bit to get done, like mucking out certain pens or, or I bought 150 trees from the conservation district's uh, you know, native plant sale. Well, gosh darn it, I got to go plant 150 trees. So I just, yeah, I get my employee to go out and do so I do have them do very specific above and beyond tasks that would take some time for me, um, but I just don't have that time to, to work on those sort of things. So I focus that person on those, those non-repetitive tasks that still need to get done. So when you, when I, when you think about your employees, um, it sounds like you have a lot of repetitive tasks that they do day in, day in, day out. But um, how do you, uh, tell me about then, is this part of why you keep a certain number over in the off season and thinking about some of the bigger picture uh, things that need to get done from one year to the next or the advancement or preparing uh, the, your farm for growth for the next year? How do you, how do you balance all of that out? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I, I'll start by saying our off season work, um, we do um, produce and sell produce year round. And so even, you know, through December, January, February, we're still um, harvesting some produce, pulling stuff out of the cooler or the dry storage and washing that, processing it and delivering it. So there, there is that amount of work that just continues on. Um, and then, but a lot of our off season work also is, um, is plan, you know, hiring, planning, um, we're looking at all our documents and our procedures and um, updating those, making changes. You know, we have a meeting um, with whoever, I have a meeting usually with everyone who's involved in each area. So like we'll have a meeting about pack shed. Okay, how'd it go last year? What, what, was, what was the challenges? What kind of equipment do we need? What do, what do you, you know, whoever's in charge of that area this coming year, what, what do they want to bring to it? What are they working on? Um, do, what do they want to work on um, to improve um, systems? training, you know, looking at all the different parts. Um, so there's a lot of that that happens in the winter. Um, and then there's also a lot of sort of cleaning and organizing, you know, our drip irrigation area, no matter how hard we try during the season, it just is a disaster by the winter. And so it needs to get organized and inventoried. Um, you know, we have some raspberry pruning, some kind of one annual, um, you know, one time a year projects. Um, we clean all our trucks. We deep clean every aspect, every air, work area of the farm. Um, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff that, um, that yeah, that we work on in the winter um, that we need, we need crew on. And that's, we usually um, try to have a rotation of managers that are returning the next year to do a lot of those projects, because a lot of it is their chance to really um, have, you know, it's a slow time so they can actually think about what they want to bring to the next year and have their influence and, um, and you know, office time to to think about these things, things that are really hard to achieve in the peak season when it's just go 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 and just you know everything flying at you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So so the winter time does give you a, a time for you and your team to reflect, think about, plan. Uh, yeah, when you have headspace to actually do that. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So the final question I have for you is we're getting to wrapping up the hour. Uh, the final question I have is. What has maintaining labor taught you about your management style? What have you learned about yourself? How have you grown um, as a manager, as an owner, having labor? Yeah. Um, so I've grown so much having employees and having uh, people working here on the farm. Um, you know, I mean, from developing my own people management skills. Um, when I first started the farm, I had a little bit of people management experience, but not very much. And I wasn't very good at it. And it took a long time to, um, 
to learn. Um, I learned from my employees and I learned from other professionals. Um, but let's see, um, you know, and there's also just been a lot of like different iterations of the farm over the years as there's been different employees. There's been years where um, we have, you know, this year, I think we have 12 employees that are coming back from last year. Wow. Um, we've had, yeah, which is great. <laughs> I think it's a record. I think last year we had nine um, or, you know, from 2019, 2020. Um, so, you know, retention is really important, but we're, you know, we've had years where we've had nobody coming back or just one person. And so, um, you know, definitely learned a lot. I learn a lot when people return and I get the feedback from them and we're just moving forward as a team and continue working. But I also learn a lot the years when everybody leaves and <laughs> start from scratch. And, um, you know, there's definitely some hard lessons that have gotten learned in there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just, I think one of the biggest things I've learned is just that um, there's, you know, I, I need to do the work to set up the clear expectations, um, you know, the procedures of how we're going to do things, the, you know, just all kind of the structure of the farm and the, the value and the mission and what's really important to me and to, that I set for the farm. Um, but then there's also a certain amount of trust that I have to um, extend to my employees, especially those who have, have deserved it and have worked, um, you know, are, are coming back season after season or have a higher skill level. Um, and I've learned a lot about trust. <laughs> um, and it's been a really, really wonderful process, honestly, to get to a point where, you um, I just, I trust my employees so much and they have so much, um, they have so much responsibility and, and a lot of leeway and a lot of room to make mistakes. And that's a huge, I believe mistakes are a huge part of learning. And so I, I love it when they make mistakes and, but I'm also really thankful that, um, that I have room in the budget for mistakes because in the early years, um, the budget was so tight that every mistake was, you know, a, a potential mini disaster. And so it's really nice to be at a place that the farm has evolved that I can trust people. I can, you know, we can, big mistakes can happen and the farm can recover from that. And we all learn from it. And I don't take it too seriously. And um, we, we can all move through it without, um, you know, any relationships being damaged. Um, so that's, you know, I think those are things that just happen with time. Um, but I've worked really hard to be really involved to, um, it's sort of like a personal growth thing. I think really is what it comes down to with people management is just really checking myself and learning how I relate to people and just constantly working on improving um, the way that I'm, that I'm working with people and, and making sure that I'm being respectful and trusting and, um, but also be having firm boundaries. It's a balance, <laughs> a lot mm -hmm. of different things, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if, if I you know, look back over the 14 years and how your operation has grown and the number of employees that have passed through your operation, um, uh, I think you're as much about growing future farmers as you are about growing products. Uh, is that probably a bit of an accurate statement too? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and just, yeah, growing future farmers, absolutely. And growing people that understand the food system, even if they don't actually turn out, you know, decide to have a career in farming or start their own mm -hmm. farm. Um, I think everyone who has worked here learns how food, you know, at least how vegetables get produced and all the work that goes into that and the costs mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, yeah, they learn a lot about it. And then to see, you know, the, the people who do start farms is just amazing that they go through this process and of working here and still decide they want to do more. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, Karen, thank you. You've been great. It's been a great hour. It's been fun oh. to, to hear um, the growth and evolution of your farm and, and the way you manage employees and, and all the things that you've gone through. Um, this has been, it's been very fun and, and uh, a great learning experience for us. And I hope all, everybody that's uh, listening in has uh, gotten something out of it also. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's been yeah. fun for me too. Good. And <laughs> so Kelly, I'm going to turn it back over to you for some closing thoughts and uh, what's upcoming. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. And thank you so much, Karen. Always a pleasure to hear about you talk about your farm very inspiring. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, our next two webinars of this first series that we're offering are happening the next two Thursdays. Each of them are happening at the same time, 10 to 11 a.m. That's our time slot. And the, this next Thursday, April 1st, is all about employment insurance. So we'll hear from two insurance agents who have worked with farms in the past specifically. So uh, tune in if you want to learn all about risk and how to cover your farm. And then the following and final 
uh, webinar of this series is happening Thursday, April 8th, 10 to 11 a.m. And it's all about the costs of farm labor. So we'll be hearing from an accountant um, and we'll also be hearing from Washington Labor and Industries. So a little more labor law requirements as well as you know, further, further information about payroll services and tax requirements about hiring farm labor and talking a little bit about the costs and um, you know, getting more in detail about if you wanna provide benefits for your employees, do's and don'ts of farm labor. So be sure to tune in. If you registered for this webinar, you should get a recurring email with the same Zoom link. So keep an eye out for those reminders for the next two webinars. Great. And with that, we conclude our webinar. Great, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Karen.